uh, there's no redoing the past. So uh, welcome, Sarah, <laughs> and welcome, <laughs> welcome everyone to uh, a Easy. rather abrupt beginning to the uh, the Sapien Beauty stream. Um, I'm so glad to be sitting here talking to uh, my friend Farah. How's it going? Yes, very good. Thank you very much. I see you you are well prepared with your um, your princesses ready to go. Yeah, I should have I should have had these when we talked about Frozen. Yes. Um, but these yes. are these are very recent additions. These are um these are little cheap plastic models okay. that my husband painted with his Warhammer skills. Oh um, wow! Proper light light sorting and highlighting, and they're really oh, very that's beautiful. Lovely. Really One good of work. a kind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a that's a lot of years of uh, experience going into that, but. Yeah. Um, can, can I just can I say just before we start, when we originally talked about this stream idea, uh, sorry, sorry to kind of give away like p personal chat details, but Poe was concerned that this is like like her channel is going to turn into a princess channel, <laughs> and I and I did want to just say that it's too late. You you already are, uh, you know, this already is a princess channel, and you are obviously are the princess, uh, Poe. I'm surprised they haven't made some kind of some, some kind of modern uh, princess story about like an engineer princess who has to. Uh, you know, having seen the tomboy the tomboy video you did, it's mm. the the storyline of the the modern Disney princesses. It's an engineer princess who has to uh, uh, you know reconnect with the female female friends of the past. That's that's my pitch. But um, anyway. I like it. And there is a kids TV show called uh, based on the Polly Pocket toys. And she is an engineer. Um, exactly. I, I have to say, it's not a typical uh, viewing experience in our household. Uh, I don't, I don't usually, uh, I, I haven't put it on, but I, I understand that she's, um, she has some kind of device that makes her tiny. That and she her <laughs> and both engineers too. Well, uh, exactly. Sorry for being distracted. I'm just tweeting out the stream, um, and I've done that now, so you have my full attention. Um, everybody, uh, please go over to Pharaoh's channel. I didn't link it, <laughs> but I will. I will link it. Um, I'm badly prepared as usual. Uh, but if you um, also would like to go see us talking about Frozen and Tangled, those are previous episodes of the PO Box. Although I believe Frozen may have actually been before the PO Box started, where it was just a standalone stream before I realized I wanted to spend the rest of my life talking about Disney movies. <laughs> <laughs> a pioneer stream, exactly, yeah. So I I knew that I wanted to review this on the PO box with you as soon as this film started. <laughs> this is like the opening this is the opening scene of Sleeping Beauty after the classic overture. Um the you know with the credits on. The the, the opening is just this massive um what would you call it? A uh, a tapestry of characters and movement and music. Um I won't go through all my screenshots yet because I believe you had some content to share. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I was going to you first, Bo, before we go into it, because you, you, you're cutting straight into the content. I, I love the efficiency of of this. Where was I the keep, first? I keep. I to keep time, them under an hour. Where Where was the first time you saw um, Sleeping Beauty? Was it Was it as a child? Do you remember it much? I was going to ask. Uh, I don't remember the first time, but we had the VHS. We had really? the, okay. the video. Yeah. So my all my memories of Sleeping Beauty are the four by five aspect ratio, awful video, you know, color grading and um, just just the the excellent quality that we all remember from our childhoods. Those of us who were born <laughs> in you know nineties <laughs> or earlier. I, I I always remember just this just as an aside, a double aside. The the intros to those Disney VHSs were always hilarious, and like you would like. You'd often see stuff that like was, was totally random or kind of like you know kind of like BT and stuff. Yeah. Even before the intro to the actual film started, there would yeah, be yeah like, exactly. The, they... or, like I, I always got the advert to get the DVD where it was bragging about <laughs> the serious sound quality and picture quality. See, it shows it shows you, you you're so much younger than me because I, I remember that there was before that before kind of referencing DVDs on the VHS and what it would be it would be like the the like zippity doo dah song or whatever and it, and it'd just be like um very annoying and you had to skip through it each time but I, I, I was just going to say that I also had it on um, VHS although it wasn't my favorite Disney growing up but um, it's one of those ones that um, you know obviously as you kind of go through different life stages you kind of revise the disney canon and I, I would put this film as my number one out of all the other disney's out there um you know because of its 
um, because of the plot, because of the design, because all of the history behind it. So I've, I've got a few, a few little bits um, chatting uh, just, to, just to take us through um, the, the making of, if that's all right. Uh, let me just sh uh, share my screen. While you're doing that, I'll, um, I, I just want to agree that after seeing this recently, um, I, I called it a peerless masterpiece in the title of the stream for a reason. I think it's it's not just quantitatively very different from every other Disney film or princess film. It's it's also just better. <laughs> um, it's not. It, there are some aspects. You know, it's not quite as they like, didn't have the catchy music and the um, maybe brilliant comedy of some other Disney films. But I think for for what it's going for, it absolutely nails it at every um, at every point. Um, yeah, it was it's uh, interesting. You, you you mentioned it, it being kind of qu quite like feeling quite different because having done a bit of research into the kind of the build up, obviously you know Disney was well est established by this point. Uh, it was about a six year development. Started in the fifties, released in I think it was fifty nine. So this is a fifties fifties movie. But Disney's well established. Walt's also creating his Disneyland at the same time, and they'd have they had a series of um, commercial successes with like Cinderella being like the big hit, but they had a series of failures in in the run up to this, and I get the feeling that Walt was kind of like looking looking to go back to the kind of bangers of the past, you know, simple fairy tale stories that would resonate really well and. Um, be of interest to a broader broader appeal now what was also i think interesting was that i would describe this as a design led process and also a background led process so if, if you know how cartoons are made it's it's a, it's a combination between um like background artists who kind of create the scenes that we see and then the animators who um you know animate the characters in front so they're kind of two forces internally you've obviously got walt as well would come in and give his opinion and also maybe some of the concept artists so i think those are the kind of four kind of pulls now interestingly for sleeping beauty walt um kind of highlighted that he wanted the um <clears throat> the background designer ivan earl to um like take the design lead on the on the whole on the on the whole thing basically. Now I've, I've, I wanted to kind of give you just a real quick couple of examples of some of the influences that they had, um, that Ivan basically said that he was um, kind of drawing from at the time. And interestingly, it all began with a trip down to the MMA in Manhattan to the medieval galleries and um, a look at the unicorn some some of the unicorn tapestries, and we'll go into those in a second, but. Uh, what, what I've tried to do is people talk a lot of rubbish as well. You know, they, they, they kind of like to build up their own mythology at the same time. So I've tried to kind of combine some of that with what I think that the kind of big influences are. But one of the um, kind of things that I mentioned that I think probably is the biggest uh, design reference is um, the, the Duke de Berry's uh, Book of Hours. A Book of Hours is a like a shortened version of the bible containing like some of the psalms and a couple of other other bits and bobs um but obviously during the kind of um high medieval period they're, they're this great opportunity to kind of create beautiful illustrations and i've got uh, just a couple of pieces from this um this book of hours now just just I, I won't i'm trying to keep this as tight as possible so we can go into the actual film but just a couple of interesting things about this medieval style uh you know often we think about this medieval period as being kind of like uh, you know, it's gothic. It's this dark and drudgery, drudging period. But the reality is, it's a it's a super colourful period. It's a period full of life and expression and and happiness and and joy. I think. And what you can see here, this is obviously the French court and the sumptuousness. You know, all of these beautiful silks. I've actually got. I'm really interested in this just from a textiles perspective. And um, I knew about the book before, kind of re researching this. But you can see, look, all all the kind of bright colours. You know, indigos, the the, the reds, etc. Um, also, sorry, Farrah, can sorry. I ask you just to, uh, is it possible to full screen your, um, the slideshow here? Because uh, it's, uh, I just want to get the, the most out of these images. I've got the mm -hmm. tiles down the side at the moment, but um, it's all right if you can't. I, I can't. I haven't worked it out yet. <laughs> I'm right. sorry. This is, this is a boom, boomer, <laughs> boomer moment. I'm sorry. I'll no, go I'll ahead. And... Sorry I interrupted you. There we go. Um, the better. other thing I wanted to say was, um, You've got 
like a flattening of perspective. Now, um, you can see, you know, Poe as uh, an artist yourself, you can kind of see elements of perspective in here, you know, like the table, for example, that there's, there's a vanishing point across there. But what's being layered on is this background battle scene that's going on, uh, which is kind of, you know, you've got a flattening effect. So it's this yeah. kind of combination of perspective, but also flattening. Um, another thing that was kind of brought out is the the quality and the detail of the the backgrounds. So so again, to the medieval artist, um, a, an artwork is not just about the people; it's about the whole collective experience. Now, here's a bit more of some hit net net. Here's some janky perspective if you want it, but they're doing it for a reason. Here, you've got a walled garden, and they're showing the apple blossoms inside. So if I just zoom in really quickly. Um, and what the artist has done, he's sort of given a bird's eye view when obviously we're kind of looking side on here. So it feels absolutely horrific. Um, but look at the detailing on there. You can see the individual blossoms on the apple or in the background, we've got this beautiful castle sitting in a like royal blue sky, two ferrymen just having a little, uh, or maybe they're fishermen, you can see with their little fishing net. I mean, this is ridiculous levels of detail. The book is quite small in, its, in itself. And... Uh, Earl like was just super inspired by this and said, "This is amazing." I, unsurprisingly, as the background designer as well, you know, he, he is he is interested fundamentally with uh, with the background. Uh, I won't go I won't go through everything. I mean, it, I mean, there's a certain stylization as well. Interestingly, for example, with the trees here, you know, we've all seen trees. They don't look like this. If you, if you were to take a photo of them, uh, if you ever try to, to draw a tree, for example, like there's branches which come down much lower. But obviously, yeah. look, here's a problem, right? If you were to draw a tree correctly here, all of the green would be in the way of the heads of this little yeah. um, little posse. So what the artist has done is say, look, actually, I'm going to have the greenery start up here. Um, and then I'm just going to make the trees all look kind of similar. You know, they've got this kind of twisty spine uh, and like a couple of uh, arms up. So he's stylized, um, stylized the trees. So that's another thing that Earl was like, look, I need to start to stylize um, things as well. Okay. I, just, um, just... I had a few Sorry. of these uh, pictures on, um, on my childhood home uh, for years and years and years. And something that always struck me is that the, the frame is full of different characters with their own little story so that you can spend, you know, every time I'd go into the room and, and look at that picture, a different sort of aspect of it would jump out you know that sort of just you could look at it for ages and just sort of think about the characters look at their faces like it's not all one idea it's like lots of you know it's an ensemble yeah 100 percent. like there are a few kind of focal points but especially with a procession it's not about the not just about the main character here it's about everyone in in kind of union and harmony at the same time <coughs> Okay, just a couple of other influences. I've, I've got this is the famous unicorn tapestry. Again, I'm super interested in this. That um, during the medieval period, it's the Burgundians who are like ma massively into um, tapestry creating. Uh, and again, you've got this weird kind of weirdness of perspective here. Um, can you see like the top of? You're looking at it from above here, but you're looking at it from uh, below. Uh, or is it the other way around, actually? But you can see like there's, there's like a weird kind of like fisheye lens effect on the well itself. Um, and, and you've got this kind of beautiful unicorn um, being hunted by the, the hunting party. So again, it's this ensemble and it's surrounding. I, I would say what's been taken from this, um, as you'll see, is actually more the outfits. Like if, if you see the kind of outfits with this, this is really kind of like the high French. This is the kind of like most fancy, flouncy style. And they end up choosing quite simpler garbs I think mainly to save the lives of the animators who, you know, just imagine having to do all of that kind of fabric moving around and probably kill you. Um, one other influence is this, this idea of the international Gothic. So um, we think of this, this period as being very insular, but at the same time, you've got like lots of people going across Europe, speaking to each other. This is, this is Mantegna who's kind of pulling from actually like interestingly Greek and Byzantine traditions. I want you to look at the rocks here. Look at these kind of super stylized, um, almost like it's out of a Byzantine um, icon. A and again, these kind of uh, the focus on the background and the um, and the details at the same time. Uh, just a few other influence checks. Just um, one thing I would say about the whole kind of design is that it's it's a bit of a juxtaposition. It, it, um, in the backgrounds, you've got detail. You've got um, focus on on um, like. This kind of more medieval style, but with the animations and the character design, it's very modern. 
It's very, uh, very stylized and it's um, very graphic at the same time. Now, by graphic, I mean um, a design where um, things have been refined and abstracted down to their kind of core components and their core colors. And um, the kind of the greatest design period, I would say, is this kind of um, early modernism period. This is one of my favorite uh, illustrators, Ivan uh, Belibin. Um, who is a Russian illustrator. And you can see here, you've got this kind of rider here. The, the horse is made of one color here, just this kind of fire, fiery, fiery red. That's what, when we talk about something being graphic, it's got that skill. Or we've got um, Otto Czechia, uh, Czechia's um, Nibelung, which is a very famous um, Austrian secessionist um, document. But you can see here again, all of the forms are simplified. You've just got a couple of colors. Um, it's not about detail. It's about um, creating movement and energy and um, and power through uh, as simple as forms as possible. So, remind keep in your head all the time: detailed background, stylized uh, graphic um, characters. And interesting thing I, I learned as part of the process was this um, leaning on what's known as the UPA style. Apparently, there was a breakaway between. Disney and some of the animators in the uh, in the fifties due to strike issues, and they created their own little group called the UPA. And and you know we've all seen this kind of like um, American graphic style before. I'm sh I'm sure in like the beginning of Bewitched, if you've ever seen that before, and and stuff like that, <laughs> like almost kind of Hannibal Barra as well. I would say. But it's known as the the UPA style, and apparently this was influencing some of the animators the, at the same time. The Pink time. Panther, the, the Pink yes. Panther cartoon. There you go. Yeah, exactly. And and again, like even on even from kind of a graphic perspective, I've got a couple of examples here. This is uh, this is from the forties and stuff. This is kind of like like I don't want to say postmodern because it's the wrong word, but like after like this this stuff up here is true true mo modern, really. I would say, but this is kind of like after the modern mm. period in the thirties and forties. You've got this kind of like um, uh, it's kind angular, isn't it? Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and and then and then finally there there are there were some kind of cont contemporary illustrators. I was trying to find examples, and I think the best example would be someone like Eric Frazier, who's a British artist working in working in the fifties. I don't know if they 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 drew from him, but he does these kind of beautiful illustrations in what I would describe like in a, in a kind of modern graphic style. Uh, again, you can see kind of like the forms here of the knight. You know, normally in reality, there's lots of wrinkles from the chainmail, etc., have been refined um, down. Um, I've got other, other pictures, but I, I, I think we should maybe just go into it. And then if there's extra time at the end, I can show you some of the extra stuff because I don't want to, um, but I, I want people to keep all of that stuff in their head. Uh, heads. Um, so like, just to kind of summarize, this is a very design led um, film. Um, Walt was basically like, uh, Earl, you, you're going to have the keys to the kingdom, but he did give a bit of uh, feedback at the same, uh, same time. So yeah, do you want to, take us through your little menagerie of uh, <laughs> uh, screenshots. I wonder if you can see I've got about 50 here um, because I was, every, that, that expression, like every frame, of, every frame of painting, every frame of pause, it's like everything in this film looks great just as a screenshot. Um, you can pick out details that you can just frame any of these and, and put it on your wall as a, you know, as a masterpiece. Uh, so I was just taking screenshots like there's no tomorrow. And like I said, this opening sequence was enough to convince me after not seeing this film for 20 years or so, um, never seeing it on DVD or, or streaming or anything. It just went straight to a, um, you know, a Blu-ray. And I just, you know, I didn't realize what I'd been missing this whole time. Like this super wide screen, all of this detail, this color, you know, the color part, the characters. Um, well, yeah, well, can, 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 we, can, we, can we just go back two slides to maybe the Herald uh, example? Um... There was four of them at the top here, yeah, right? So, so again, so so remember, whenever you see kind of like the kind of lighter, brighter colors, that that is the hand uh, cell shaded um, um, acetates that are placed on top of the background. So the background is normally done. I think it's like by spray spray painting and stuff like that. Um, I've, when I've yeah, seen brushes, Earl do it, watercolor, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're usually go. huge. Right like they, they they've got. I've seen the the making of this film, and it's like you know an a, a naught sheet of, you know, that this illustrator is just sort of leaning over this huge uh, drafts board of the, the actual background. 
Um, yeah. And then they, it's all done. It's not done by computer. It's all done in camera. They lay the acetate, the painted acetate over the background and, uh, and, and take a photograph of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly, and a lot of yeah. it, and uh, we'll, we'll get to it later, but some sequences aren't even really animated in this way. There's sort of, there's some very trippy <laughs> kind of sequences where they've done some very clever in camera stuff. Um, well, well, yeah, yeah if, you, if you've ever watched um, like a Scooby-Doo or like a cheap cartoon, you'll you'll know the difference between the background and the foreground because you'll get the you know, the door or the brick in the wall that's about to come out because it looks like a it looks like a block of sort of coloured in uh, paint rather than the uh, the background, much more detailed watercolour. Well, well, that's what I was going to say. Compare these backgrounds. You know, I was watching uh, 101 Dalmatians with my uh, daughter this morning. And it's just sketches. With this, every single scene is has been totally uh, beauti beautifully rendered. I mean, this is an example of like one of their um, special effects. I'm pretty sure they've put in some some of those columns in the foreground. Did you just see here over yeah. the top of the main um, the main work to help with? Because because again, they were doing lots of these little okay. camera effects. But this is the kind of parallax to it where they're moving yeah, yeah. at different speeds. Yeah, exactly. Um, you get but this kind is a of sweeping shot. This is the juxtaposition. If, if sorry, we'll go back to the heralds one last time. Look at compare compare the backgrounds to the heralds. Right, the heralds, their face is one color. It's very very simple. Their clothes are simple um, design as well. So you have this um, angular modernism in the in the character design, and uh, but it's always combined with the detailed backgrounds. But um, sorry, please please continue. No, absolutely. That's um. I, I love just looking at like every single brick, all of the patterns on the tapestries on the on the decorations it's um it's really a feast for the eyes just looking at the the backgrounds but but then also just the character animations are extremely fluid like there's no fudge sort of in between uh anim in between animations like everything it's like everything is really well done <laughs> you know the characters expressions and the the characterization the voices of course um we'll, we'll, help with that we'll, we'll, we'll just on that um could, could it, can I just quickly share? share can, I, can I quickly just show you a couple of scenes from um, something else that I managed to build together? Sorry. Hey, um, go ahead. Just because, like, um, what's interesting was the level of reference work that these guys had. So again, if you're an yeah. artist, what what you would normally do is try to pull three or four um, reference images together to help with um, your picture, and especially for animators who are looking for that realistic, um, uh, realistic looking sequences. They literally had reference footage for everything, which blows my mind. So they basically recorded the whole film once with um, with the guys. Now, interestingly, they actually used like for Maleficent, they used the voice actor who um, who played her as well. Which I, again, I love that kind of continuity. But um, you know, when when you see some of the see some of the scenes, for example, you know, um, we'll see this later. Um, the level of uh, detail and groundwork. Um, that, that was built up as part of this, I think was, you know, uh, pretty, pretty special. So I just wanted to share that as well. That's, that's why, um, that's why I think things look so real because they've got that combination of um, lots of reference imagery. And also they've got just at, at this stage at Disney, so many really good quality animators and like different, good, like a film doesn't happen because one, like just one person's good. I think maybe one person's vision is important, but they they have like it's good all the way down and all the way through in every single way. Yeah, and they were willing to spend the money on it as well in a way that I don't think there's any filmmakers who are really like the studios that are that that have this spirit anymore of just making beautiful art that's going to last forever, that's going to stand, you know, stand the ages. Oh, yeah, they they just they didn't want to spare any expense. You know the, those those pictures that you just showed of the actors performing it in real life. Those costumes they're wearing were bespoke designed costumes that they wanted to film them in. You know, must mm. imagine how many steps there were just to get to that part where they have the actors on a stage performing all these parts, and they haven't even drawn a single character yet. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and again, with the costume, just like you said, they had a costume designer that designed everything. I, I was hear, hearing all about um, the princess's dress and some of the influences the costume designer came from. So again, it, it's mm -hmm. just like that level of of thoroughness and and depth to it. Um, but just just plot wise, right now we we kind of we're kind of greeted with a big procession, and it's a meeting between two royal families: uh, a king with a son and a king with a girl. And essentially, it's about the joining together of yeah. um, 
uh, two families. The kingdoms. Yeah, the at this part of the film, they seem almost um, like they're they're teasing you with not seeing the baby. Princess Aurora True. is um, said yeah. to be like beautiful and joyful, and everyone's really happy that she's born. But they never show. I don't know if they were just too <laughs> too scared to show the baby, like so, because she's going to become an adult later. Um, but the they, they don't show the face at all. We see everyone looking at the baby and holding the baby. Um, but this is our Prince Philip. Um, coming to meet her and he's like not impressed at all which I, you know it's kind of funny and they, you know, they gave him blonde hair and made it brown later which is a kind of true to life um observation of children that they weren't afraid to um just show you that uh they, they, they weren't afraid of confusing you um i maybe it's a good time to uh point out an overarching theme of the film uh, which is something i also talked about in the in the making of documentary is that there's no, there's no sort of cutaways or subplots. They just give every scene room to, you know, play out with beautiful music and beautiful imagery. It's not, it's not boring. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's watching this who hasn't seen Sleeping Beauty. They somehow make it engaging without adding a bunch of random uh, banter and jokes. And uh, there's no mice like there in, in uh, Cinderella. There's no sort of, um, there's like. Other than the uh, the, the drunk, uh, what is it called the, the bard later, there's really not much um, kind of going on other than just the story. The few mm. the, the few pages of the fairy tale they they give you that, and they the, just the length of the shots and the scenes is quite startling. It's it's really very impressive the way that this this entire sequence of people just walking up to the palace being really excited to see the princess. We see them in there, and it, it yeah, takes, like, there's, minutes there's, before there's no, it, anything's no, even yeah, happened. Yeah, no dialogue whatsoever. And again, I think that's just... just that, that's something I, th I think we miss. Um, like, er everything's about, like, instant satisfaction. Uh, uh, ac action, action, satisfaction, as my friend always used to say, <laughs> where, 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 again, it's just, like... Or, or even with the intros, you know, how, like, they would have a full credit sequence with... Um, uh, you know where they kind of go through some of the different s songs that you're going to hear in, in yeah. yeah overture sorry yeah um like we just can't have that nowadays because you've got to get your instant gratification and you can't have silence for more than five seconds otherwise the zoomers will like zone out and get their phones out in the cinema <laughs> so uh but i think they they also like i said about this throwing money at this they there's lots of shots it's not just one long shot of the same thing happening for too long it, they are doing these cuts and these sort of camera movements. These sort of, they trick the sort of camera. It's obviously not a real camera movement, but they, um, yeah, they, they they trick the the framing of it so that it, it feels like there's movement, there's it's music. It, it is engaging. Like, I I don't want to uh, give the impression that oh you know kids think this is boring. Like I don't think anyone would think this is boring. It's um it's just great. It's just you know new backgrounds, new characters in every every, every yeah. shot. The, the way the way I think they keep the kids' attention is just just from the colours as well. So, like I think I think they notice from the Book of Hours, like it's there's lots of bright reds and uh, blues. Can we go back to the procession? I know we keep going back to the same the same same far ones. Great. Um, but if you just look at the colour range they've got inside, um, you've got purples, you've got greens, uh, and and everything in between. I mean, they're they're still everything's harmonised though. Interestingly, I mean, just look at the like this is a blue scene if that makes sense. There's the blue background, the background, the castle has a blue tone to it. There's blue tones in the in the greens of the grass. So they it's still stylized, it's still harmonious, but they've got these kind of colour pops like the um, the pink on the on the edge of the um, um, the horses. Can you see or like the yeah. the, the pink in the flags etc. And that's what's going to keep a small child's eye on the screen. You know, it's the the super bright contrasting colours. Mm. And you've got that sort of layer. It's not quite a flattened perspective. It looks kind of realistic, but you've got that layered um, sort of storytelling within the frame. You've got the people in the foreground, the background and the castle in the same shot with these sort of strong vertical lines. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I think they kind of, it's more stylized, less, um, less about that kind of pers perspective dropping, but um, yeah, the fair, do the, fa the fairy intro. Yeah. The, um, it, it's going to come up in the, this, streamed a few times I think that the fairies are um, in terms of screen time and dialogue certainly they dominate the film as almost like the true main characters They're, they are the the one the, the the agents who drive the story 
um, who are in, they are it, it's the fairies versus Maleficent basically, and everyone else is just a um, almost a, a pawn in their in their battle of their, their magical battle. Uh, they they're really um, they're really great characters. Uh, the, the voices and the um, the way they're drawn, they yeah you'd think having three um, sort of motherly old ladies uh, who are all fairies who all basically have the same powers. You you know you might expect these characters to all turn out the same, and that you know the I think the in the Maleficent I actually dread to bring this up, but the yeah you know, that awful uh, sort of sequel yeah. retelling uh, re, re, from twenty fourteen the the Maleficent movie they try to do a kind of maiden um, maiden mother crone sort of thing where they they're all quite yeah, different yeah. to each other in, in sort of superficial ways i it's oh, it's uh, awful but <laughs> these are what, these women are are great i love all of them for their for their personalities yeah i was just going to say wicked and its consequences for the human race uh <laughs> has you know literally wicked has caused all of these kind of the same thing with um Oh, uh, what's the stupid hundred and one Dalmatian one? Uh, cruella you know they redid cruella yeah, 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 it's yeah. It's, yeah. it's all about it's all about actually like oh it's just the social it's nothing to do with the nature of these people. They're not naturally evil. It's because they were just wronged as children. There's a complicated backstory. Again, it's just it's, it's fa fascinating to me. But um, yeah, the, the the fairies turn up, give their blessings to the child. Um, or two of them. I do. love and, I love these sorry. these bits where they give the blessings, and he just cuts away to these like like I said, it's like slightly trippy, um, very yeah, dr conceptual yes, abstract. Yeah. yeah, dreamscapes exactly. Um, really, really pretty, really beautiful music, and it just lets it play out for like thirty seconds each. You get this sequence of the the, the fairy bestowing their gift and showing the, this um, yeah, very dreamy animation with it. In this one as well, um, I want to go on a brief rant. I was thinking about this earlier. Give me a rant corner. People say uh, the characters in this film, talking about Maleficent and um, Aurora especially. And and the prince, I suppose they call them, you know, one dimensional. That's the new. I, this is the most midwit phrase ever, and I'm, I apologize to anyone watching or on the stream who uses the term one dimensional. But the, you know, the the term. It, the idea is that a two dimensional character has no depth. You know, the, the depth would be some sort of other aspect to their personality that is not all converging on this one thing about them. So in the case of Maleficent, it's just evil, like pure evil powers of hell evil witch queen there's not there's no other dimension to her she doesn't have a backstory or anything um but this not only is it a is sort of missing the the, the point of the story the, 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 the archetype or um you know it, it's kind of making a criticism of the the character you know making it seem like it's a fundamental flaw of the character that she doesn't have any other aspects to her but what really annoys me about the term one dimensional is that it's just like oh they're so they're so on they're so flat they don't even have two dimensions like they're not even a 2d shape they're a 1d shape like she's like a single she, she's mm. like a single line with no not only does she not have any depth she doesn't even have any width um which is just, like mathematically and uh you know geometrically doesn't make any sense so that's my, that's my <laughs> soapbox I, love, I love it that, i mean that's an that's an epic serve at the end there you know doesn't even make any uh, uh geometry like, like Here's my here's my thoughts on on this just quickly. Um, what people like, okay, the reason why they might say that is because there isn't this laborious backstory about Maleficent and where she comes from and what her beef is. And I think this this is genuinely the problem with modern storytelling. People are genuinely just too stupid to um, either kind of read the symbology or to understand the nature of people or to understand um, archetypes both thematically from a story perspective or, or in their real life, right? F from 30 seconds of seeing uh, Maleficent, you know everything you need to know about her uh, archetypically, right? Firstly, there's flipping green flames coming off her, right? Okay, N like just the colour palette they've chosen for her shows the sickly, sickly gr green. She has literally got a pair of horns um, on, on, her, on her head. She has this kind of... Um, like dark beauty to her at the same time. Again, I think that, that's one of the reasons why she's, you know, you know she's not like the, the ugly stepmother or whatever. There is kind of like, she's got the kind of red lips and um, uh, eyeshadow, but at the same time, you know that she's 
quite like an a, an evil, harsh um, character. People fear her as as the, as she arrives. So what? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think what's what's really interesting with her character is, you know, she has a kind of beauty from the from the front, but often if you see the profile of her, they give her this absolutely huge jaw and really crooked nose at the same time, and this kind of like, you know, the ph phrenology uh, check. Uh, you know, just absolutely, absolutely rings rings off about her. But it, it, in my mind, um, you know that that tells you about the nature of her. Um, you know, what, what she wears on the outside is how she wears on the ins. Uh, is what how she feels on the inside, as uh, Morrissey would say. Um, but but also her her you know simply she she has been wronged. You know, the, the, the whole plot is she wasn't invited to 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 the. Um, to the blessing, and so she's enacting her revenge, and and I think this is a, a real classic um, archetype: the wronged woman. I immediately think of someone like um, uh, um, Medea or Circe, you know, like a powerful witch woman um, with with magic, who is kind of like a kind of a beauty and a kind of uh, a, a darkness to them, who are wronged and spend the rest of their kind of plot or story. Um, getting their revenge, like that's all. That's all they need. And also, have have you have, like people? Have you genuinely not met people like this? I've met many, <laughs> many women who is that their entire like raison d'être is simply um, revenge over something small, like a small slight or whatever that that they've kept with them for years and years. You know, sorry to to be down on women on, on your channel channel po, but women have a particular ability to. Women have a particular ability to retain memories from years and years before about the most small of slights and will bring them up at regular intervals uh, about it. So, you know, I, I think there is a there, there there's more than enough um, from the visual storytelling to give you the depth and the, and the character character. And again, like, what about imagination? That's the last the last thing I'll say is like. <laughs> You, you, the, the beauty of storytelling is to give you um, the framework and you can kind of fill out the rest yourself. You know, maybe you'd think that she's um, like a, a yeah, a, a powerful witch or something, or maybe she's a queen from a foreign land or whatever. Everyone's got their own op opinions on it. And that's the, that's the beauty of story. Today, we have to tell everyone everything right down to the nearest detail. It's kind of like this, it's, this is the problem with nerds, I'm afraid, because they, they're going to write a Wikipedia about like her entire childhood and upbringing and stuff like that. They want the details. They, they're constantly pestering the writers for, you know, what was the what flavored ice cream did Maleficent like as a child or something like that. You know, just just like give give characters room to, to breathe. Anyway, they, I've given a counter rant to your uh, to your rants, but anyway, have you have you seen Jordan Peterson talking about Sleeping Beauty? No, no, I haven't. No. So he, you know, he has this whole thing about uh, fairy tales and especially uh, Disney films and Pinocchio. But he also had a little bit about Sleeping Beauty, where he he says that Maleficent is a um, she's a symbol for she's an archetype of Mother Nature. Like she's the negative aspects of just the the world the you know the the bad thing she, she's like the incorporating the shadow you know she's like the the shadow of the entire world and when she's not invited to the christening it's a kind of um it's it's her parents being overprotective it, it, it aurora's parents the king and the queen because by not inviting in the bad parts of the world by sheltering their child too much they they're only delaying the, the the inevitable so that that's why she has this extremely sheltered upbringing for the first 16 years of her life they managed to keep her in utter ignorance and safety from e everything bad in the world by hiding her away um and when she reaches adulthood she becomes um completely vulnerable to uh to everything that occurs but i um yeah th these days uh john peterson's taken quite a fall in terms of his uh his output uh, i think a lot of people will uh, understand that without me having to go into it so far be it from me to recommend jordan peterson um but this is from years and years ago when he was still doing his psychology lectures and he <laughs> he showed his uh undergraduate students sort of skills from disney films as a, as a demonstration of these uh archetypes um, brilliant so yeah it, it, yeah there's, that, that's one read of it that seems to kind of make sense yeah um, no, for me. yeah it, <clears throat> Again, I, th I think there is that room and that flexibility for 
for, for those kind of um, things to be pulled upon. Um, but basically, she she gives a quote unquote blessing, saying that she's basically going to get killed. I, I recall if that's right, she's gonna she's just gonna die before her sixteenth. Yeah, she says that the the, the spinning wheel um, on the day of the, before the sun sets on her sixteenth birthday, Aurora is going to prick her finger on a spinning wheel and die. Um, you know, I often recently wondered why, like, why the why pricking your finger on a spinning wheel? Like, is that something that could cause death? Is it a kind of tetanus or some kind of um, disease that once it gets into your, like only a tiny prick, once it's in your blood, you know, it can be fatal. Uh, I wondered if it, to, to the medieval mind, whether this was something that could happen. Um, I mean, I, I think you're. I don't know, that seems too that seems way too scientific, Poe, for, for the for, okay. for this. <laughs> I, I I'm gonna say there there's significance with the symbology of the spinning wheel. You know, it's kind of mm. like um it's tied to to womanhood, isn't it? Like the, yeah. this is all about, you know, 16, it's like becoming becoming a woman, um, becoming her own woman, but getting married at the same time, and that's like what you, you would spin. There is kind of like the, the wheel itself has um like like potency as a as a uh, as a symbol, uh, but maybe you're right. Maybe it's just the the disgusting sheep germs on the uh, the, sp the spinning. Have, have you ever tried spinning before? I was going to ask. No, I have not. Uh, not not all of us are textiles uh, artists. Okay. Well, my, my aunt is just basically she's like one of those kind of like really weird people, and she used to spin her own wool and stuff like that. She would like go. Sort of, you know, like scrumping for, for like apples. She would go scrumping, but for like bits of wool. Ooh, bits of wool, that, I love it. Yeah, yeah, and then would make her own clothes out of it. And I rem remember as a child going in and see her kind of spinning. Um, you know, and and it's, uh, it's an impressive. It's a very difficult thing to to do. Um, you know, it's, it's a very skillful uh, operation. So uh, yeah. Anyway, spinning. To get onto the uh, back to the plot, it's um it's Merryweather, the last of the fairies who is not yet given the good fairies that is, she's not yet given her blessing. Um, I don't know if Maleficent didn't realize this, but um, she can't undo Maleficent's curse, but she can take the edge off, and it's due to Merryweather, the least of the um the, the, the fairy godmothers, the smallest and the most kind of impulsive and childish of the of the women, gets to give her. Um, her blessing and she yeah, she softens it saying you know, she, she won't die on her 16th birthday she'll just fall into a deep sleep only to be awoken by love's first kiss um which is you know a, it's a fairy tale archetype the uh, the first kiss being the um being the remedy also in in snow white yes of course i mean i i always felt that this was a bit of a cheese plot line because like oh yeah we can't i can't undo it like you're basically undoing it by modifying it at the same time. I, I don't know. That's <laughs> it feels like that shouldn't be allowed. And I mean, I'm not really a curse death expert. Is, yeah, death is like sleep enough, you know. Yeah, exactly. But and, and yeah, yes, that is the plot. I, I buy it. Uh, yeah. So that that so in response, even though Merryweather has uh, softened it, the, the the king and queen are still terrified by the prospect of their their daughter um, pricking their finger on a spin her spinning wheel. Um, so they burn. I think this is an overreaction. They they destroy all textile business in their kingdom by burning every single spinning wheel that um, that exists. I, I I suppose they went house to house, but you know, barging in through the door to to find every last one. Or maybe these people loved their princess so much that they um that they willingly gave them up. They're probably yeah um, uh, yeah. I, I imagine so. I mean, you just ruined the the livelihoods of uh, you know thousands of peasants just then. Yeah. I hope you. I hope you like the wall you're living in because that's the that's the last <laughs> wall you're going to buy for a long time. <laughs> uh, I love this shot. Like this, obviously, I love every single shot in this film. But the this sort of sequence of the burning spinning wheels, like the dramatic music, and then we pan up to see the um, the what they call in the making of. They called this um, this fairy is Flora. I love that name, by the way. Flora is what they call the bossy fairy, which I think is really unfair because she is suddenly the most oh, assertive. She's, oh, she, she's exactly. Got plan. She's the she's bossy. Come on, the most. Assertive. But the other two have no idea. Do, do you see yourself <laughs> most? Do you, do you see yourself about. most? Do, is that is that like you? I was going to ask which fairy do you most associate with? 
Yeah, probably Flora. I wasn't thinking of it in those terms, but I think like <laughs> the other two are completely useless without her. So like she's she's really she's in charge by default because she's she's the only one who has a good grip on reality and the control over her emotions. So uh, I, I thought that was unfair. And we have this um beautiful. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I just love like something. Like, maybe it's the nostalgia for this. But the fairies they 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 come up with a secret plan, but they don't want Maleficent's um sort of ears all over the place. You know the uh a supernatural hearing ability to be able to eavesdrop on them. So they turn themselves tiny, and they go into this little chest where the cups are kept, and they have this conversation while sort of sitting in these little goblets and. It's all just really sweet, and the the animation, the you know, the way they come up with the plan, and their three personalities bouncing off each other, just really, really endearing. With this very gentle comedy, like it's not, it's not really silly or goofy or sarcastic in the way that a modern Disney film would be. And there's some appeal to that as well. But these these three, this like really this dynamic they have together is just so enjoyable, even if it's not sort of laugh out loud funny. I really enjoy them. No, de- definitely. Like it's it's definitely like not slapstick style it's yeah more grown-up humor and i think that's why it's got this kind of like appeal to children who would instantly love the characters of the fairies and could understand like they can understand like they wouldn't understand the nuance of the different personalities but again i think they would see they're like oh that that woman reminds me of my aunt or that woman reminds me of you know that woman at <laughs> church very real, or whatever, you know. yeah exactly very relatable characters i think they um in the making of they said that they were based on three real women that they knew <laughs> <laughs> the different animators sort of picked out these um these sort of doddery old women that they knew so very well meaning um but slightly ineffectual uh sort of women <laughs> as an yeah. archetype but in a in a very gentle gentle loving way that they're portrayed yeah uh and we have this storybook they keep coming back to um from the start i think it's actually a film that they they made this real book they made a book filmed- yeah and filmed them opening this jewel encrusted tome and then sort of turning the pages as the story goes on. Every time they cut to a narrator, you get these uh, this beautiful sort of illuminated manuscript book that they're flipping the pages of. Like you're you're experiencing the the, the fairy tale that's been passed down for hundreds of years, which which you are. It's it's almost like like a meta <laughs> a meta story because the art style is slightly different again and it's different pictures, etc. So you, do you know what I'm saying? Like it's a different uh, like cast, so it's a story in the story um, as well. So again, yeah, it, unbelievably opulent. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've just got more stills here. So we, we cut back to Maleficent, and she's trying to find where Aurora has gone. Of course, the, the fairy's plan um, to go back to it is just to hide Aurora away in a little, a very sweet cottage in the in the forest where apparently Maleficent can't find her but then and they have to give up their magic as well the, these fairies who really know nothing about what it is to live as a human have to give up their magic for 16 years just to take care of this little baby um all, all on their own and she she can't be introduced to anyone else it's got that kind of um Rapunzel uh sort of story element where as far as we know it, it we're sort of led to believe that Aurora who's now called Briar Rose, which is her sort of um, witness protection program name. <laughs> she uh, <laughs> she's never met she's never met another human being in her whole life except for you know when she was a baby and these three these three fairies. Uh, so I, I yeah I love like I love everything in this film. I'm just gonna keep saying that, but I love Maleficent. Like it, it, all of the uh, it, it doesn't really come across in the stills. I mean it does, but just her character movements and her voice are brilliant. I love seeing her on the screen and it, it, all of it. Her little soldiers. Yeah, I mean, just on the soldiers again. This is straight out of like, um, like uh, high Renaissance, like Gothic minions. Basically, if you go to like a Hieronymus Bosch uh, painting, you'll see the, these this kind of band of characters torturing humans in hell or something like that. You know, uh, but but again uh, and again, the, the kind of colours, this kind of sludge green and black uh, combination. It's a visual symbology which tells them that they're aligned to Maleficent because it's still that green base to them, but it shows that they're despicable characters at the same time. You know, this is this is again if you if you can't pay, pass the phrenology check of the, these minions, you know, it's... they look like gargoyles, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
Oh, you are okay, good. Um, they've got that kind of glowing eyes, like the cats. They're really like not human. You, you really you don't have to feel bad for these guys if they get cut down like grass. I can't remember if they do get killed in the end. I, I, I don't think they meet like a good fate. No, uh, but think... yeah, you know, Maleficent and her minions are not human characters who you have to feel sympathy for. They are just evil personified. Yeah, someone's also pointed out the um, the type of animals as well, which is again, yeah, like. They're not nice creatures or whatever, you know, the alligator or the uh, the vulture, etc. Mm, yeah. Or the pig, yeah. or the pit, or the pig. No comment on uh, on <laughs> on the symbology of that. I like how they're all different, different height, different builds. Like each of these would have taken hours of sort of character design. They've all got different weapons and different armor. And there's not just these, um, you know, the six that are on the screen now. There's so there's of loads them. there's loads you know interesting story if only these guys had access to a youth center growing up their lives would be totally different <laughs> that's the that, that's the backstory yeah. you find out in maleficent the film so and uh and the crow of course we a raven it's, it's a raven with these, these horrible pink bloodshot eyes that is maleficent's oh. best friend yeah can, can we just get a zoom in on that profile here this is what i'm saying about Male maleficent's profile Her chin, yeah. Yeah, it's like the chin going further out than the nose. It's a classic, um, like, evil woman um, chin archetype there. And again, that like, there's a literal right angle on that nose right there. I could put, I could put like a tea tray on that nose and it'd be perfectly balanced. You know, that's that's what. So, so again, it has Maleficent has this kind of like glossy feel or like uh, a thin veneer of beauty. But again, when you, mm. you get to know her more and her personality, you know just how evil she is. Her, her eyebrows that always stick out to me like the, the she's got these huge eyes but then the eyebrows are arched like inches above her eyes in this in this beautiful uh arch oh, with po, this sort of shadow underneath po this is my challenge to you for, for halloween this year you need to to do maleficent uh i think it'd be really good a good challenge can you get eyebrows that high that's the question mm, yeah paint them on like up here i think yeah <laughs> uh, at least there's space on my forehead for it um, yeah, I, I don't think it would do justice to it. Like cosplay never quite lives up to it, unless you're, you know, if you've ever been to a Disney park and seen the the real princesses, because they they seem to be like the best cosplayers in the world. Like they're really beautiful girls with like this permanent white, perfectly like done smile. Like they just hold this beautiful smile for, I presume, hours at a time. <laughs> I went to a Disney park in Hong Kong where all of the Disney princesses were Asian. They were all you know, <laughs> Chinese heritage. And they were they were the most beautiful Chinese women you've ever seen. I tell you what, they were they, they were nailing it. You, know, you, um, you kind of forgot that they were not the um not the ethnicity that they were in the films. Was um was Mulan White? I can't I, I, I don't know if I saw all of them, but <laughs> should, that, that would be funny, yeah. <laughs> they should have flipped it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the the cottage. Too. Uh, there, there was once an art, onion article that I think about all the time, um, an onion headline that said the uh, New England village too quaint for human eyes. Uh, that's what that's what this cottage is. It, it's <laughs> built into the the roots of a tree. Um, just stylistically, can I say there's also a marked difference between the kind of castle zone and the forest zone. And again, if you remember back to some of those Mantegna paintings, look at the, the ridge on the background across there. Uh, sorry, by castle, I mean like the, the, um, yeah, the, good, the, 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 good, the good castle is actually like not that stylized. I think it's it's quite like not like quite normally, like try and render houses normally. But the forest is this like this en enchanted place where all of the trees are kind of warped and pulled into kind of new dimensions. Um, so this is the problem with all the, your tab-based system, Per. You lose your tab, and that's over. Um, but, but again, like, yeah, look, look at the branch on the right-hand side of the tree. You know, it's literally a right angle. You've got this verticality to everything at the same time. You know, so yeah, it's a it's a super stylized place. The color palette again is like um, has the kind of blueness of some of the earlier scenes, but there's a darkness to it as well. Lots of shadows in there as well, giving you that kind of you know it it's it's a uh, it's a calm and peaceful place, but there is a darkness and uh, hidden away nature to it. You just reminded me that my my daughter, while watching this, said that it looks like Minecraft, <laughs> which I thought was like, you know, obviously kind of maybe wince a bit, but uh, it, it, yeah, 
it's kind I of see true. What you're like, you know exactly yeah, every, yeah exactly this the, that's the stylization yeah 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 well, we'll come back to some more images later where the the tree branches make a perfect square in that kind of minecraft way yeah so she's not wrong um yeah again just more of these adorable character interactions we finally see aurora aka briar rose as an adult she gets her first lines in the film and we're something like 40 minutes in <laughs> maybe not quite that so we're about 25 minutes in to the film and briar rose aurora finally gets to have some character and then she's a she's a very dignified princess she's not a ditzy character like um like anna from frozen or uh, rapunzel she's not really she's not quite as innocent and clueless as at Cinderella, you know, she's she knows exactly what her um what her godmothers are up to, um, but she's sort of she she's very she's knowing enough to uh, to go along with it. Yeah, they she, they, she, they want they want. Go on. Yeah, she 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 plays she plays along and she knows her her part. But like again, I think she's got that dignity. Just on her outfit again, the the costume designer said that it was based on like a peasant's a traditional peasant's outfit as well. So again, you've got this. Um, it's it's interesting where if you were to look at her garb, you'd say again compared to kind of the sumptuous silks of everyone else, um, you know she's she's just a nobody. But again, it's in her physiognomy, it's in her character and her nature to everyone else. Within twenty seconds, you know that she's of noble birth. You know she is this kind of elevated character at the same time. Mm -hmm. And again, I think I, I like that idea of uh, yeah the ca character overflowing out e even of her. Look, look at the kind of drab uh kind of yeah. grays and uh you know bo 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 boring colors can we just go to the next slide a second because i think that's um the next tab the close up yeah yeah look at the background i never noticed that on the left hand side look through the window it's the <laughs> plates on the back wall again that's that attention to detail that like yeah and, and the creativity and imagination to come up with that is like just mm. next next level that background in itself could be a, a, an artwork i would say mm. yeah absolutely um, I, I was going to mention this. This scene takes place on her 16th birthday. Really, cut all of the all of the action in between. Nothing, nothing of importance happened. We cut from the from her birth to the uh, the christening to 16 years later. Exactly. Yeah. Um, she's turned, it... turning 16, which is the day that the the prophecy is supposed to come true, and pretty much the rest of the film will take place in this day. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it is lean, but again, that's why I think it's so punchy and um, oh, again, I like like, it. Yeah. And, and, the, and the kids uh, kids like it. I was going to ask, how would, you, how would you rate her beauty in terms of Disney princesses? Um, I mean, I, I don't know, like as a... Yeah, well, she's definitely very beautiful. Woman's perspective. They, they haven't given... We talked about Babyface in our Tangled review, where yeah. the, the new Disney princesses literally look like babies. And she has definitely got she's got a narrow chin and cheekbones mm. that really distinguish her from um, from an infant. Um, so she's obviously got that youthful beauty, but she she's supposed to be sixteen. She looks more like a sort of twenty twenty four year old in the in That's the true, um, yeah, sort of structure yeah. of her face. Not that yeah. I hold that against her. I, I, I really like that she um yeah she's got a very narrow waist and narrow wrists that um, yeah, long narrow neck. She looks very beautiful. She got um, long hair. I think she probably looks a bit generic. If you put her in a different outfit, she would look like Cinderella, you know. So I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, she's not my yeah. not the best designed princess, but it, it's fine. I, she was blessed with supernatural beauty. I was going to mention Flora, the first one to bless her. It's almost got a kind of um, you know the Iliad where the you know the, the various um, goddesses each sort of promise a different. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. blessing uh, on Paris. To, to Paris in yeah, this case, yeah. she gets all. She gets all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so Flora, Flora gives her the beautiful face. Beautiful, you know, she gives her physical yeah, beauty. Yeah. Fauna gives her a beautiful voice, which is also how she she wins them the prince's heart. And of course, Meriwether promises her not to die, which is a, <laughs> probably <laughs> the best of all three gifts. Yeah. Uh, so you, you kind of get the impression that she's just irresistible to. Uh, to men you can she's kind of she's got even though she's got one day to meet this prince and fall in love with him so that she can have you know a true love's kiss uh yeah. you know she, if anyone could achieve it she can because she's uh, supernaturally beautiful 
Yeah, if we're, if, we're, if we're speaking about perspective, I love this this shot that you've pulled yeah. out. Look at the, look at the, this tree compared to the tree at the back. We're almost looking down it, but the one at the uh, at the back is just like in normal foreground, basically. So again, he does like you know twist the perspectives. Again, interestingly, with the tree choice, you know, like a pine or a spruce or something like that, you know, so it's got it's got that alpine feel as well. You know, underappreciate underappreciated like. Uh, symbology of trees as well. Yeah, oh, I, don't, I don't, can't speak on the symbology, but it's got that kind of spiky, slightly frightening look to it. But I love that it's not it's not what a child would draw. Yeah, it's not the first exactly. tree you would think of. It's, this is it. This is, this is it. Yeah, it's, it's not. This is like a bit of a hipster tree choice. Let's be honest. But yeah, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, uh, I I can't. It's it's so hard to describe music, especially for someone not. Um, as untrained as I am but I I just love like she's singing to herself for, for this part sort of talking to herself and throughout the film you've got to just take my word for it if you haven't seen it um just just wonderful music based of course off of the Sleeping Beauty Suite by Tchaikovsky especially this um this song the um Once Upon a Dream Once Upon a Dream yeah the lyrics I believe were original for this it, the ballet is just Oh, you know, instrumental without without lyrics or voice. It's it's not... interesting here, here for this for this shot for for um, Briar Rose. They've got the verticality, but here we've got the kind of horizontal plane. Here, can you see just this mm -hmm. large f flatness? I, I mean, it's a bit of a mix, I guess, on on that shot. But mm -hmm. here, and, and they've compressed that tree down um, to the left of him uh, on the left. Like that is like an absolute fat fat trunk. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I oh, like it to kind of give that yeah the weight weightiness to it. You've got these square treetops and the straight yeah. trunks. This is your, my this daughter. Is the, uh, this is the Minecraft. Minecraft. This is this has ruined it for me now, Bo. You, tell <laughs> the daughter to ru like, ruin the design. design. You can imagine some ore just at the bottom of here, like tempting oh. you to go down. <laughs> ashes, the ashes. Uh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> So yeah, she's uh, she has this little banter with the uh, woodland animals, and I, I have to say, I in in Cinderella in in Snow White, I've always found these like relying on animals to be a little bit it's like a bit too much, <laughs> like layered on. Like she's she's not just supernaturally beautiful and good at singing; she also just has the natural affinity of all woodland creatures uh, who who sort of dress up as a prince it's a, it's a very charming sequence don't get me wrong yeah yeah but the, uh, it, it's it's something that they were leaning on very heavily with princesses it's like animals like her because she's good and they can it sense the inherent goodness of people did you uh have you ever duetted with a gopher as a child you know oh, all like, the time. yeah exactly that's it this is why you're the prince the princess you see yeah, I mean, it's not very, it's not very European, is it? Having a little chipmunk, and um, you know, obviously, these squirrels <laughs> and rabbits are very, um, and blue and bluebirds as well, I believe, and not uh, not native to Britain. I mean, wh where does the um, where does the Sleeping Beauty? So it's German, uh, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it's German. Okay, well, I, I can't speak for the um, ecologies of Germany. Maybe they have bluebirds there. I love this tree. Like all the, I, even the, my my screenshots aren't doing this justice. Like all of the lines mm. on these trees and the leaves in the background of trees that aren't even sort of completely in focus. Uh, and the, the, these sort of sketches up here, I can just gush about the background of this film all day. I didn't mention the um, something that I didn't like in Snow White or in. Uh, I think they do it in Cinderella as well. I can't remember when now. The the rotoscoping, Snow White, is completely rotoscoped. They that which means that they filmed an actress uh, doing doing all of her acting and singing and moving around, and they drew over, you know, they traced over parts of it to make the performance look better. But it never it never did it never really convinced me. <laughs> like I was always mm. very aware that I was watching a rotoscoped performance. Yeah. Um, they don't do that here at all, ever. Uh, even though they did, of course, heavily use the references, the characters look completely Disney-like, and they, they have that um, sort of supernatural quality that just um, puts you right in there. You really makes them makes them well, human, weirdly enough. The, the, this is the thing about um, reference. It, again, like, if you're starting out as an artist, you should rely on reference. I think it's good to have, like, the reference in, in mind, but as Roskin would say, um, 
imagination is where we you know we come up with the greatest art and and you know like you don't the thing about imagination is it's built on like on practice and rote wrote learning and so he always recommended that for the first 10 years of being an artist you just work from reference and from life and from nature and then for like after that you just go straight up imagination or you you you, you'd you'd see a reference and then you just try and pull it out of your mind or to try and abstract it i mean if you look at the kind of the the hands and the shapes here everything's been simplified stylized you know that that is not like okay look at his his hand for example right at the forearm, you would normally have like a, a curve at the you know the bulge of the muscle groupings at the top and a slight curve on the bottom, but they've they've turned it into like a trapezoid shape, if that makes sense. They've simplified it, but it get, it makes it more effective. It makes it more again this this idea of graphicness, more stylistic, uh, and yeah. it makes it stand out. You know, it or also again, makes like, his, his physique is different from hers. You look at how straight the line on his neck is compared to how curved her is. Hers is. Yeah, she looks much more feminine. Even though he's quite thin and genteel looking, he is more masculine because he has these big pointy hands and sort of straight straight lines that make him up. Well, she, there's no straight line on her at all. You couldn't mm. pick a single one out. The um, uh, have we discussed the waistline discourse? Oh, uh, it's probably not even worth our time. But the um, you know, people saying the the, the feminists, the, the millennial feminists, who are obsessed with Disney films, as all millennials are, um, myself included, the the obsession with the t- like tiny, tiny, tiny waists shown in Disney films um, that just sort of accentuate the figure. If you look at h- how narrow that this is, it's about as narrow as her neck. <laughs> Obviously, her neck's been covered by hair here, so you can't see quite how it is. But yeah, it's certainly narrower than his neck. These are not realistic proportions. <laughs> Um, but it gives you the silhouette that sells the yeah this is this is what she looks like in, in animation the bold silhouette goes a long way to uh, you know the huge eyes you, I think we talked about this bit with the, sort of the baby face it's it, it's very it's very stylized but the, the sort of feminist discourse would um, would argue that this promotes an unrealistic standard for women to achieve. Which I mean, yes, it's unrealistic, but I don't know if this is ever a um, <laughs> you know, ever should be seen as a as a standard. Um, but there was well, that sort of super skinny aesthetic from um, a few decades ago that caused a bit of a, a moral outrage. The, again, like I said, it, the, you just got to see it as stylization. Uh, you know, is is his neck? You know, is his neck being a total straight line mean that I want to go out and get? <laughs> neck surgery so i have a tube for a neck rather than uh you know an apple's adam's apple or whatever you know so again i just think it's just um just saltiness just pure salt um also when you're doing um this kind of uh artwork but i think you you are so right with the word silhouette you know because you've got to understand how the, the the eye and the brain interprets objects you know, we, there's almost sort of like two levels to um, understanding objects. And, and the first view is like the, the rough form, you know, or, or, or the silhouette. So what we do is if, if you were to kind of like um, uh, black out the character, or whatever, so she was just a shadow, you would still be able to identify who or what she is just by the silhouette, basically. And that's our kind of our first mental barrier that we go through. And then you look at the detail afterwards. So again, it, 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 if you were to widen her out, I think it would make that silhouette less like less effective. Um, so I'm I'm personally think that it's not uh, yeah not for it. I want to I want to look at the one of the most dis- recent Disney princesses I can think of. I mean, it's pretty thin, it's a pretty thin waist. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, look, it's not yeah. much not much wider. She's than not her neck. she's not plus size. But it is it is more realistic. It's still narrower than her head. It's also her a head, bit of she's her. got really wide shoulders. That's what's unrealistic about her. And like, look at her pathetic, pathetically small hips. She's you know she's not going to be bearing many. She will not have a yeah. large tribe with those hips, madam. I well, not that we're here to talk about Moana, but maybe one day we will. I mean, look at how, look at unrealistic proportions on Maui, for instance. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the um, I, yeah, I'd argue that they've you know in animation. 
or in, in, in many kinds of art, you inflate the size of the head, the face, the eyes and the hands, because these are the these are the points that the eye looks for to determine expression, to, exactly. you know, to read someone's mood and their tone. You're looking at their eyes, their eyebrows, their mouth and the hands. And so you draw these things larger, um, sometimes to absolutely comedic effects. You know, you know, if you look at like a cartoon like Daffy Duck or something, you know, they, all, all animal-based cartoons have this, they, they give them actual hands. No, no duck cartoon, D Daffy Duck or Donald Duck, they have hands, they don't have wings because you, you can't read a, a, what would you call it, a figure. You can't read their mood without using their hands and their face. Um, yeah, that, that's a bit of a divergence, but I just I wanted to mention it because you can see her tiny waist here. <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to stop saying that I love, I love it because I, this whole sequence, it's really Aurora's only scene. <laughs> she, she's a baby at the start and she's asleep for the third act. But this scene, it does all of the heavy lifting. It does, it, it sells the film. Like you get that they are, that they are in love, that they are good people. The, you're on their side. They have a little yeah. bit of playful banter. And you you completely buy that these two people fell in love in fifteen minutes. Yeah, because, and, you know, and, and, and 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 just on that, like modern storytelling is so bad about uh, so bad at getting like characters over, you know, like making us like them. You see, you see this <laughs> in all of the kind of like um, Marvel films or whatever, where there's just that they have they have so many characters and so much opportunity, and like, do you really? I don't really care about a single one of them because despite all of those hours about backstory, like, you know, telling you about the origin story of this person or the other, they're just like not likable people or they're not interesting people. And again, she, you know, what, what do we, what do we really learn, learn about her? She's, um, she's a dreamer. She's imaginative. Uh, you know, she's walking around with no shoes on. She's kind of got, got this kind of creativity. She's a free, she's a free spirit. She, um, you know, respects her, uh, her elders She's, you know, she's going out and like sorting stuff out. She's not a, a sluggard, you know. She's she's getting getting stuff sorted to make the family work. So much about her character, you're like, okay, she's a, you know, she's a, she's a lovely lady. And then again, with, with Eric as well, you start to get this this idea of um, his character Philip. as well. You know, he's he's a he's a charming individual. He's funny. Again, he he shares some of the characteristics, but also is different and acts as a bit of like a a foil to some of her to some of her behaviors as well so again you know and they work really well together just in that short little scene don't they and like, even the animals there they're like it's a great couple absolute power couple already <laughs> yeah i uh i guess my um my only complaint it's philip by the way eric is the prince oh, sorry. in uh, little mermaid sorry uh, but the his his fighting ability that comes in later, of course, when he has to battle his way to the queen, has not been established at any point during his screen time. It's just sort of assumed because he's a prince, he must have had sword fighting training and knows how to, uh, you know, he has the strength to carry a, a, a sword and shield on, on horseback. You know, I get it. It's uh, <laughs> it's economic storytelling. You just have to you just have to believe that, that he, um, and of course the fairies do help him at the end. I'm getting ahead of myself, but... Um, yeah, this film is, it's the, what do you call it? It's the pivot point. The, the whole yeah. film revolves around this. Like, without this working, the whole film wouldn't work. It's got yeah, the iconic so. song, the only musical number that you could, you know, the only song that's sung by the characters. Um, but nothing, nothing before or after can make sense without this scene working, and it just absolutely does. Um, and meanwhile, we have an, another sequence that I just um, adore is the three godmothers preparing a, a birthday party for um, for their Briar Rose, Aurora, um, for which they they can't use their magic because they're still hiding from Maleficent for just one one more day. They've got to keep her secret, and then they've done it. Um, but they they want to. They're so sentimental about this little baby that they've raised from you know, for sixteen years that they they really want to give her a good send off and show how much they love her by making a dress and a cake for her. And I, it, it, it really just bothers me. This uh, <laughs> the uh, the whole sequence of them making this terrible, this terrible dress, and uh, yeah, she's Meriwether is the, the dummy 
and Flora is just throwing this material around her. As a, as a textile, uh, as someone who works with textiles and clothes, how does this scene make you feel where, she, where she's dressing the dummy? I mean, this is about right for uh, modern uh, modern designers, if I'm honest with you. If you, go, if you see any kind of... Lady Central, Gaga. Yeah, Central St. Martin Stewart's, uh, students cat, catwalk will have stuff like that on there, basically. But uh, <laughs> again, th their heart's in the right place. I just love some of the little kind of like... Um, vocabulary nuances you know like the uh when he's baking the cake she'll just go like oh she, she just goes cups 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 and stuff like that and it just reminds me again just like of old ditzy women that i've i've met in the past you can again just talk to themselves or just say ran random stuff like that and again it's it's just very it's, it's like classic incidental storytelling as part of it but yeah the, the, the heart's in the right place but ultimately totally and utterly useless and yeah, end up using magic to uh, um, yeah make things work. Yeah, and it, and it works for a while. And we have this callback to the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice from, from Fantasia, the walking mops cleaning up and everything. I think they indulged in that reference perhaps a little bit too much, but but I enjoyed it. And we have uh, Fauna making the cake. Which she just basically tells the ingredients what to do and imbues them with the sentience. Um, oh, yeah. She's so used that she can't do it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. She when, when instructed to fold in the the eggs, she she picks up two eggs and just puts them in the batter without <laughs> cracking. She just puts the eggs wholesale yeah. into the batter and then yeah. folds the mixer over them. <laughs> I shouldn't. I, I really should have got the screenshot of it. But um, there's that beautiful moment where she just pushes down on the batter and the eggs crack, and you get this <sighs> like picture, of this expression on her face where she's sort of like, "Oops!" <laughs> she realizes like what she's done wrong. Uh, very good. Um, yes, yeah, so they end up using magic, which is uh, yeah, they make a beautiful dress and a beautiful cake. Um, but they're again, they're bickering about making the dress pink or blue. Um, well, I was, I, I was going to ask, fuel. make it pink or make it blue. What's your what's your choice? Uh, yeah, pink, I think. Yeah, I mean that that's what they've gone. The, the Disney merchandisers have gone with pink as the canonical color of. <laughs> of Aurora's dress in all of their sort of dolls and their marketing um, in all of the ensemble pieces where you have all the princesses gathered together she's always wearing pink so Flora really won that won that one um, she uh, yeah so they, they they're firing uh, charms back and forth to to make to, 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 have, to make this dress the color that they want and uh, that the, even if they hadn't done that they may have got away with it but um, Maleficent's uh, Raven is flying over the forest and, and is attracted by the um, the magic coming up the chimney and he hears everything they're talking about and all of them the weeping they're doing about um, about sending sending their rose away that they they're going to miss her and they they say that oh she's a princess and the the Raven gets the whole story through the chimney. Um, can, can I just, um, I just look, again look at the character design for these? It's so good. I mean, we talked about un unrealistic waists. Who's talking about the unrealistic <laughs> cheeks of uh, the short tubby one? You know, look at those absolute chonkers on that that girl there. You know, that's yeah. that's that's unrealistic um, jowl standards for old older women. You know, I like how their um, their waistline is also their bust line. You know, they're, they're just. <laughs> The top of them, it's just like a snowman. Merged. Like the top of them is just yeah. one big lump, and then the bottom of them is one big lump because like, it's it's simplified, and they're, they're old ladies with the uh, with big sagging bosoms. It's uh, it, you know, it just works. It's kind of somewhere between an empire line dress and a uh, uh, and just the, 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 the yeah. gravity taking yeah. its toll. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, they look they look different. They've they've got three different hairstyles, three different headdresses. Uh, so they're all they're, they're just different enough to give them personality uh and once again there you know, this is another scene with lots of dialogue between them and and, and not much uh, anywhere else where they uh they reveal everything and then the raven finally knows where where rose is after um where aurora is after 16 years uh just so they're on the the cusp of success and uh i didn't i didn't get the screenshots <laughs> again there's this wonderful sequence of the the godmother, the three fairies, taking Aurora back to the palace in, um, I don't know if it's the cover of night, because it's not night time yet, so it must be the, sort of the night before. Mm. They they put her in this cloak, and they just let it 
unfold, unfold going through different, what do you call it, vistas, <laughs> these different backdrops. They just, you know, you, you just got music and fairies and walking for, a, you know, maybe 30 seconds. But it's a really, it's just so much space and just a, a really enjoyable sequence with no dialogue and not very much action, but still just, just wonderful to watch. Uh, mm. I didn't get any screenshots there, unfortunately. Uh, back at the castle, we have the two kings. One, this is uh, Aurora's father and Philip's father. Uh, I can't remember what they're arguing about now, but it's it's another sort of side character um, interaction that takes up screen time because it's uh, yeah because there's not much story. They've got this sort of extra scene. Um, do you remember what they're fighting about? I can't remember. I mean, the, 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 again, this is sort of like one of the kind of. If there was a subplot, it would be like their kind of like bickering, uh, but ultimately friendly nature. And again, this is where they kind of get in some of the kind of comedy angles and a bit of the slapstick. I think in in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the film, but it all works I, though. I like it. Yeah, exactly. Like it yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have uh, again. I, I get a bit short on screenshots towards the end here, but an important plot point is that uh, Philip is now in love with what he thinks is a peasant girl and he comes back to tell his father that he will not be marrying a princess but he'll be marrying this um this peasant who he found in the forest uh who who, sat, who was really beautiful and she had a beautiful singing voice um and his father's devastated uh which i thought was just sort of pointless um time filling that was just sort of supposed to be like an added layer of complexity but it ends up being the um a key point uh you know in the in the third act and maybe we'll get there uh, to be fair to be fair if my son came to me and said i'm just marrying some random bint that i met in the middle of a forest with. In, instead of this like multi you know probably mega rich heiress that i'd spent ages that was going to continue my political dynasty be a little bit annoyed as well yeah, you've been you've been betrothed for sixteen years. This has always been the understanding that you'd get married to her one day. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe we're talking too much about the plot here, um, especially now that I've run out of screenshots. I um, the another another sequence that I really enjoyed was one that terrified me as a child. I'm really disappointed I don't have a screenshot of it. But the the sequence where um, Aurora she's devastated to find out that she's a princess because she's in love with Philip. She doesn't know that she's betrothed to him, and she um, she thinks she's gonna she thinks she's this princess. She's never going to see this mysterious uh, soldier who she met in the forest again. Um, she she thinks that's over. So she's distraught, and the fairies leave her alone in the room. She falls asleep. No, she doesn't fall asleep. She throws herself on the bed. Um, just just beautiful. She's she's sort of on the dressing table looking at herself in the mirror. Um, and when the fairies are out of the room. Can I, just say, I, do, I, I do that all the time. Just dramatically throw myself on the bed and just stare <laughs> at myself pensively in the mirror. She's um so she's alone for the you know the, the crucial moment on her sixteenth birthday before the sun has set. Um, it, we're just on the on the cusp of success. She's about to be reunited with her family, and you know she's about to discover to the light that she's actually betrothed to the man that she's happens to have fallen in love with. But oh no, Maleficent's found her. And she, Maleficent, just enchants her bedroom to become a like a secret passage to uh, towards a a cursed um, enchanted uh, spinning wheel that is uh, that makes the curse come true. And there's this really haunting sort of well, sort of dreadful scene. It's a it's a it's a very well done um, frightening sequence of Aurora being bewitched to walking into this fireplace that becomes a hallway, going up these stairs slowly, slowly, like enchanted by this green light that Maleficent has sent to guide her. And the fairies sort of following her, realizing that she's in danger, trying to catch up. And, you know, you know we know the prophecy. We know the film that we're watching. You know, we all understand that we're watching a film called Sleeping Beauty, where she's going to fall prey to this curse. And yet the the scene is so um, so much suspense and 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 mood, and it was very frightening for me as a child. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point, actually, because I think, again, just comparing this to a lot of modern cinema and TV or whatever, there's a lot of moments where I'm just kind of like, oh, we know this person's going to live anyway, because it's, well, you know, they call it plot armor or whatever, you know, yeah. my, my, my plot armor. So there, there's no kind of like, you don't worry about the, the, the character at all, or there's no um, intensity, but you, you can, if you're a skilled storyteller and you're um, kind of pull on the right strings, you can still evoke a response out of people, even though it's literally the title of the film. You know what's going to happen, because <laughs> and, and again, th th again, this is a classic um, Greek archetype in some in some ways. You know, this idea of the fated person, uh, the tragic person, someone who uh, you know we both know how this is going to end up, but that we watch, we still are interested in the story because um, you know it. it there's kind of beauty in that tragedy there there's interest and it's yeah that 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 moment of and feeling of dread that's what makes it interesting and that's why we kind of keep coming back to the same stories time and time again absolutely there's there's some stories that improve with re-watching or re-experiencing and just as you alluded to the sort of classic tradition of oral st storytelling where there wouldn't be that many stories like the, the number of stories that your culture could handle would be limited by the number of pe stories that some people can memorize so you would hear the same stories over and over again and you you get this you know, the, the start of the story might even summarize what you're about to hear um, because everyone knows anyway and so there's the story is just scattered with foreshadowing and um, we'd call it dramatic irony, like everyone knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but quite different to how the stories are told these days, where yeah, you, you might make a film expecting your viewer to watch it once um, and put in lots of surprising twists and things like that. And I'm not saying that's worse necessarily. It's just it's just different the way that we experience stories to to our ancient ancestors. I, I am saying it's worse, just to be just to be clear. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, definitely an argument for that. Um, and meanwhile, uh, Maleficent has uh, Prince Philip in the in the dungeon, and she's taunting him, uh, saying that she's only going to let him go after a hundred years, so that he can finally fulfil prophecy. Like she knows how fairy tales work. You know, she knows that she can't actually undo the the blessing of the fairies. So she knows that fate is going to you know, take its um, take its path. Uh, eventually so she she has to let him go eventually so that he can go and kiss aurora uh, but in the meantime she's going to make him wait there for 100 years and uh, yeah another another brilliant sequence i forgot to mention is the fairies sending everyone every single person in the kingdom to sleep so that time is just frozen in that in that moment where they're waiting for the princess to arrive um everyone falls asleep and again it's just a long sequence of you know shot after shot after shot of people falling asleep fairies sprinkling this sort of sleepy dust and they yawn and they sort of all sort of drift off um with beautiful music uh just just love it uh and that's why the the i think maleficent knows she has the benefit of time because the the, the all of the entire kingdom is uh, just frozen in this one moment and uh in a hundred years she's going to let philip go to to limp off powerlessly to um, to kiss Aurora and, and wake her up, only to only for him to be a very very old man with a really really old horse. Uh, yeah, I mean the uh, what more is there to to say about the plot? Um, the the fairies help him escape. Yeah. Again, the fairies take the sort of the leading role. They are really the instigators. He he does a good job and he's very brave. Um, yeah, he, he's good with with a sword and with his horse, but uh, ultimately it's the fairies who. Um, can, can we just go back again to, again to the kind of the color landscape? Just two tabs before, where you see the fairies, because again, <clears throat> uh, yeah, there we go. Can you see how all of their colors have been muted as well? So again, it, like mm. they've toned, they've they've sat, um, turned down the saturation on it, so um, they're not as bright, and you can see it's the, the again the acid green. Uh, Maleficent's color is the one that dominates. So again, you know whose realm it is instantly through the uh, the visual storytelling. 
yeah, there's this sort of uh, heist sequence where they uh, the, the, the fairies sort of break in and have to get get by undetected to to rescue to rescue Philip from his chamber. Uh, yeah, and then the Maleficent, now that he's escaped, is not, um, of course, not satisfied to let him go, and she surrounds the the entire castle with uh, with lots and lots of thorns, um, bramble. Uh, th this is part of the original fairy tale, isn't it? The, the sort of brambly yeah. um, exterior that he has to cut through. He makes pretty short work of it, but visually, it's very um, very striking. This, this was the kind of stuff where, which re reminds me of the Eric Frazier um, work. I mean, what, what's interesting is that he's had to make a compromise here because there is just so much depth, right? Just think about how many individual, like, briar, thorn trees, right? He's got, like, a row of about 20 each side. If you, if you combine that with the kind of um, high-level, uh, realistic depth he's had in some of the other scenes, it's going to be overwhelming. So what does he do? He he puts in a couple of touches. If you notice the um, the tree on the right hand side, the tree on the left hand side, they've got like little highlights. So it's a mm. three cut. It's a three color palette here. No blending mm. whatsoever. And again, that's it's it's sort of creating um, because again, like the, the brain would it would just be too much, or it would it would pull away from. What we want to see, which is the red shot here again, uh, Philip's yeah. coat acting as the central point here. Um, so I, th I think he's he, he's obviously really thought about trying to create these kind of medieval style scenes. But when the moment strikes, he has this kind of he's, he's prepared to compromise and say that we need to make it more graphic. We need to make it like more about again the silhouette is way more important here than the, the color and the the uh, the depth you're not going to spend a lot of time looking at these trees but you've got to feel like you're totally uh, encompassed and again i love how the branches again reach up almost like um um like an archway but it's it's done in a haphazard way if you if you've ever seen like um what do they call it when they cut back trees to to mold them or whatever there's a special name Bolarding. okay yeah but like if if you see that in real in real life you've got these kind of beautiful like oh it's an apple trees meeting together over like cast iron or something like that there's there's a real beauty oh, in that okay yeah we're sort yeah sort i think there's another there's there's, there's another word for it. i can't i can't quite remember what it is but anyway look, look how haphazard that all of the thorns are as well there it, it is mm. totally wild totally uncontrolled totally inhospitable so yeah i think this is another scene that jordan peterson was talking about sort of arch archetypally this is man versus nature. You know, this, this is the inhospitable world that, uh, that he has to battle through to um, to get to. Just, uh, just, to just on that, just on that, Maleficent as nature. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure because, like, again, she has a castle rather than like living in like a cave or something like that. Mm. And again, one of the other symbols is like green fire. It's something unnatural. Like, it's um, yeah. it's super, 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 super natural, supernatural to it as well. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, she she's just super, super, super spiteful. She's uh, she'll do nothing. She'll stop at nothing to uh, <laughs> to stop Philip getting to Aurora. Uh, yeah, so the thorns are the first sort of layer of defense, and then she becomes this enormous fire breathing dragon. Uh, she, she just I think they sell that she she's got all of hell's power. That's one of her lines. <laughs> what kind of what kind of magical abilities has she got? Well, it's just limitless. Like she can just do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, you know a case of uh, David and Goliath because she you know, we've got this we've got this prince we've got this human <laughs> human man with three doddery old women helping him <laughs> versus this uh, this massive dragon with magical powers uh, who you know apparent ageless you know just uh completely limitless power and that's the sense we get in this fight and we get the um the the fairies enchant his sword in the final confrontation and he um from hell's heart i stab at thee kind of chucks it well he chucks, <laughs> he chucks it, it at her. like that that is like rule 101 of i've got to say i've done some fencing in my time Rule one I want is you never <laughs> throw away your weapon. It's very bad practice, very, very, very yeah. frowned upon traditionally. So I think it was a bit a bit cheap. He should have just got in there and like shanked it. But uh it's certainly a dramatic, mm. uh, dramatic, dramatic scene. And again, look at look at the background here. You, you can 
it, it's just these kind of blended diffused flames um like you, you, you have like in hell isn't it yeah yeah you have you have like the the actual moving flames but again just look at the 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 background behind it and um it's, it's just so, so clever without any because again if you've ever tried to draw a flame it's really really hard um yeah um, because you're trying to capture something that that isn't there it's kind of like a, a ethereal and if you if you were to draw a flame true to life um like if you look look at okay look at the animators flames i mean this is like bs flames flames do not look like this in reality they're not like these <laughs> snaking curves etc if you see a fire it's it, it's kind of very much more vertical much more like the background and again that's that's where mm. uh, um Earl's done a great job where he's managed to Again, just use his. Uh, I keep keep saying air gun. I keep coming up with the stupid name of it. Um, what's the painting? Uh, air painting well, um, medium. Anyway, I can't remember. But like, like you can create these beautiful uh, uh, diffuse backgrounds, um, which I think, yeah, r really work it's well. Like airbrushing. Yeah. Airbrushing. I keep forgetting airbrushing. Yeah. Um, one other thing I'll, I'll say is that the, the the dragon form of Maleficent again is is masterful because again it's just a, a very abstracted uh, face, but it like interestingly it's not that um, medieval as what I'd also say. Again, this is the, this is where I feel sure. for like the background versus the animators. If you see like the medieval archetype of the dragon, firstly, um, basically until about the fourteen fifties. Dragons mainly had two legs rather than four. Um, they also would typically be shown with like these kind of curved tails. Uh, often, like they're they're much less like a lizard or a crocodile um, than we think of today. Like we've got this very kind of sixteenth century view actually of what like what a uh, a kind of classic medieval dragon looks like. But there's a much more kind of janky, I would say. So they've kind of given up on that. They've got this kind of very reptilian form. Uh, I really like the, um, can you see how the wings have got this transparency um, to it? Mm. But I think best of all is the face, which has been re just refined and refined down into this kind of like, uh, I don't know, like a, like a cylinder for the mouth. Uh, it's slightly like a, a slightly bigger uh, like square for the head, for example. Um, you know, it's, it's very... Um, it's it's simple shapes which gives you again the silhouette it gives you the feel of it without having to go into all of the detail because again if they went for that traditional style medieval dragon it would just be too much because they're they're kind of like a bit goofy i think you know like like especially to our modern sensibilities um so yeah i'm trying to find another um image for for us again i lost some of my i took loads you... of screenshots and then some of them were lost C could you just search for medieval dragon as well maybe and then you I could just have okay. a, oh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll, I'll put I'll put Maleficent dragon up on the screen first. I'll go on in the meantime. Yeah like yeah. these real you kind of um when you're talking about your your graphic uh sort of illustrate illustrated design I was thinking about Samurai Jack you ever seen that TV show? The um they've no. got very block um characters like very like no outlines it's just yeah almost like south park like paper cutouts it's yeah, yeah the, very, the, the, there's, there's, no, there's no there's no gradients there's no shadows to it as well all all you get is um that the the, the sort of pseudo highlight from the the purple line which then matches up with the rest of the outfit again even with the eyes there's no pupils or anything like that it's just a single color the teeth um don't have gums they just protrude straight out of the, of the mouth so it's you know what it reminds me a little bit of? Maybe like even like an African mask or something like that, like a tribal mask. Mm. Um, but it, I think it's very evocative of just her true um, evil nature, basically. Just maximal scare factor. Is this the kind of dragon you're thinking of? No, uh, this is this this is too, that's 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 too that's too modern. I'm gonna I'm gonna find a proper dragon. You keep on going, and I'm gonna get you. I'll get you a, a good uh, a good one. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, I, to to sum up the the last act of this film. They really ramp up the pace. You know, I said that there was lots of space for sort of visual storytelling up to this point, and they they up to the point where that that really dramatic scene I was talking about with uh, Aurora about to prick her finger with the sort of the, the the suspense leading up to that moment. Right from there to pretty much the end, 
to this moment, there's um, it's non-stop pacing. Um, and I think the the background design, and the, the of course the music reflects that as well. But they, um, I, I guess it's I mean, the entire film has been building up to this um, th this pace of the uh, Aurora being asleep uh, and the, the prince having to fight his way to her. He's really the last hope. Everyone else in the kingdom is asleep. Uh, it, it's a really beautiful, um, exciting, sort of dramatic uh, sequence. And just to come back, one, one last thing about this dragon. Um, yeah. The screenshot doesn't show it, but his last, I think throwing the sword is his last ditch effort because just after this, um, I took the screenshot, he, he drops his shield into the flames. Yeah. He's backed up into this um, precipice. He's about to die, and I think there's really nothing he can do but throw his sword. Um, so that's quite a. Um, just just, just a quickly, I've, I've just sent across the, the private chat the the, uh, the kind of standard goofy uh, medieval dragon art, um, that you you tend to see. Uh, this is by uh, Paolo Acello, who's one of my favourite um, Renaissance um, artists, but. Like, I know, I know that um, you know, old thing good, new thing bad, and all that. But did like old artists? I, I, you know, obviously they've got they've got a lot of technique and um, lots of skill and lots of experience built up. But the way that these fantastical animals look so goofy makes me think like, did they just not have much reference material to build off? Like they hadn't quite figured out how to draw scary dragons yet, or this is just like what they thought a dragon. Like, it was less of a scary being than it is now. I, I mean, I think it's partly they they are building off tr tradition, and again, like they 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 actually copy from um, like Byzantine sources. Um, so again, they have to do certain things to kind of show it's a dragon, like the curly tail, for example, or the two feet. <laughs> um, but. Um, it, 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 I, I don't know. It's difficult. It's very easy for us because we've got infinite re reference material, infinite resources. But all, all, all my count, all I'd say to my to counter to your point, Poe, is all modern dragons look the same. They all have this kind of glossy Dungeons and Dragons, very polished feel to it. And um, I actually feel like I, I don't really like many modern dragon designs at all. They, they all are. The like, dragon design hasn't changed since the seventies, since the dun like Dungeon Dragons Second Edition Monster Manual. That's kind of like def defined what a dragon is, and we've just been riffing off it and ripping off the same same piece. Like at the, at the very least, at least um, uh, you know the, the the dragons are kind of unique and uh, are, are interesting. I mean, I would say this isn't Uccello's best best work, and and uh, he's famous for some of his hunting scenes and uh, like. He's famous for his horses, and again, like the, the horse, uh, the horse is actually w rendered way better than um, than the, dra <laughs> yeah. the than the than the dragon, you know, and, and um, the, the two characters, I think. But um, yeah, it's an interesting question, though. I haven't uh, really got a strong answer to that. But yeah, we need to delve more into uh, why aren't medieval dragons fearsome enough? Mm. I, I just wonder if maybe they weren't supposed to be the most frightening thing ever. They're just some kind of lesser demon. It's somewhat it's a threat, but it's not the biggest threat you could possibly face. It's not absolutely enormous. Yeah, I, I mean you've got to remember that a threat. single a single knight was able to defeat it, where again, like mm. even in even Tolkien's again, I think Tolkien has a lot to answer for his smaug, for example, sort of re reinvented genuinely, like again, he reinvented what the dragon is in terms of its power level and what it does. And it and it again elevated from uh a monster that like that because because again the the story of St. George and the Dragon comes from um, the Book of Golden Legends. I don't know if you've heard of this, which is like a collection. It's like a, it's like a hagiography of um, like famous, famous stories, um, which comes out from, um, fr from Byzantium again, or derived from it. And that's why St. George is actually um, Anatolian. He, he is a, he is a Greek, he is a Greek Byzantine, but the story, interestingly, is basically the same as um, Andromeda and Perseus. You know where they offer, where they have to sacrifice people on a regular basis to keep the, the monster at bay. Um, but in this case, it's a Christian knight which comes and uh, defeats, um, 
uh, d- defeats defeats the monster. So, but you have to have a single guy on a horseback killing it. So you can't imagine Smaug versus Saint George. He would just like hmm. wreck, wreck him, you know. So I, I, maybe yeah. you're right. Maybe the confines of the story means that it can't be much bigger than a human, really, can it? Say. So. What's the? I don't want to spend too long on this, but what is this? What is this figure well, she, here doing? Is it a clapping or? She, no, she she's praying, but she's she's the one that's oh. been say, saved by Saint George. She's the sacrificial, the daughter of the. Can you see oh, the yeah. back? Okay. Can you see? So the whole story is that they they have like a lottery, yeah. and the, and mm. then um, her name is drawn out, and her father's like, no, don't go, and so he hires, um, or Saint George is passing by and says, I'll I'll save her basically. So you can see right. that's that's her in the background with her family, and then being uh, mm. brought out to the dragon's lair to be sacrificed, and Saint George uh-huh. running running it through. Yeah. No, I like it. I uh, have to cover that another time. I uh, obviously don't know enough about uh, our own history. Uh, yeah, uh, back to the Sleeping Beauty, though. By the time he's defeated the dragon, um, there really isn't much else to tidy up. There's, um, of course, everyone in the king. He, he kisses the princess and she wakes up and then everyone else in the kingdom also awakens. Um, and we get a little bit more, uh, just a little bit of conclusion with the banter between Philip and his father regarding the identity of the um, his bride, uh, and of course he's um, yeah you know, she's delighted to discover that, she, that the man that she fell in love with in the forest is uh, but again no lines she wakes up and she comes down the stairs in this beautiful dress but still she doesn't have any dialogue after this <laughs> her last line of dialogue is before she falls asleep before she pricks her finger um, just. Uh, yeah, she's uh, she's really not the main character, despite the, the film being named after her and the whole fairy tale being circulating around her. Uh, well, one thing I would I would say is that her dress is very unmedieval. Actually, if you see um, mm. the women's processions and stuff like that, uh, I'm just trying to com- I'm just trying to compare it again. I think it is that use of the corset there. Uh, can I, can I just present my screen again, just quickly? Okay. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about the sort of fifties era fashion for women. Is it is it much more um, in keeping with what the the fifties sort of aesthetic, the uh, the silhouette that they were going for with their skirts? Yeah, I I, I, th- I think I think so. I mean, to be fair, look, I mean, look at the waistline on that. Basically, that is that's pretty tight still. So may, maybe it is. Uh, but it's empire line. It comes just under the bust, not at the actual yeah. the, not the waistline. Yeah, true. And this one, true, yeah. the one right in front of her has like an open, an open neck, like Aurora. Yeah, yeah, actually, that, that, that's true. I think it probably been lace. I bet if you zoom in, if we can. Mm. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Like can, uh, dress. Yeah. 